Um, you will soon see that um, I'm going to be taking a very different tact. Um, I have a very small lab, and I'm not a cancer biologist. I'm a developmental neurobiologist um, with an interest in neuroblastoma that was inspired in me by Giselle coming to the University of Vermont. And of course, it kills me that she's coming here, and I won't be able to talk to her on a daily basis anymore. But we will definitely still stay in communication. Um, as a developmental neurobiologist, I thought I would start off by reminding you that neuroblastoma um, starts off um, probably as a transformation of neuro, normal neural crest progenitors. And um, what's interesting about the neural crest, which sort of starts up here um, in the dorsal folds of the neural tube very early in development, it's a very highly migratory population of cells that uh, goes throughout the embryo to form all sorts of um, derivatives, the peripheral nervous system, the satellite cells of the peripheral nervous system, components of the heart, um, cartilage in the head, um, melanocytes. and um, it's probably no surprise that if you take these precursor cells, and here are where the sympathoadrenal precursors are, and you transform them, that they can turn into a very aggressive type of cancer um, that may develop in sort of sequences of quiescent differentiation, followed by, again, highly migratory behavior, um, followed by another quiescent stage. Um, which makes it a very, very difficult cancer to treat. And of course, um, many of you know, I'm sure the parents know, that <coughs> most of the frontline treatments in cancer and in neuroblastoma are drugs that target DNA replication. So these are very important because they kill rapidly dividing cells. However, the nightmare and um, especially in neuroblastoma, is of course this possibility that there are stem cells that are set aside. And um, while the, d the drugs that target DNA replication can very uh, rapidly um, kill off dividing cells, here's conventional uh, cancer therapy, the blue cells are the rapidly dividing ones, um, the conventional cancer therapy can kill all of them save for the stem cell, which is quiescent, it's not rapidly dividing, it's simply self-renewing, it's not targeted by the drugs, and it's left behind to then turn into another rapidly proliferating tumor that can also metastasize if it goes back to reflect its origins as a neural crest cell. And of course, it might not even be what we might classically call stem cells, but um, also, the fact that neuroblastoma can go through these phases of differentiation and quiescent growth that will not be sensitive um, to uh, drugs that target rapidly dividing cells. <coughs> so clearly, um, there are new uh, therapies that are needed to kill stem cells or quiescent cells um, that might be sitting there. As an, and these therapies would be used as an adjunct to treatment with conventional chemotherapy, either together or possibly during intervening stages. And um, no. you already heard from Pam um, that you can get neuroblastoma cells from bone marrow aspirates. And David Kaplan showed early on that these bone marrow aspirates give rise to neurospheres in culture, which have a very high tumorigenic potential. So um, these uh, neurospheres that form from um, the cells um, taken from the bone marrow aspirates can be uh, um, uh, passaged um, repeatedly in cell culture. For all intents and purposes, they're immortalized. Um, these. Um, in cell culture, these neural spheres behave like stem cells in that you can put them into conditions where they will differentiate into neurons. Um, they carry neuroblastoma markers, um, and they're highly tumorigenic. Um, only a, a few cells, when injected into a xenograft, for example, in a nude mouse, can form um, a tumor. And therefore, they are uh, tumor-initiating uh, tumor cells. Um, now, also, um, you again, because you've heard Pam talk, you know that um, 
Giselle and Jeff Bond have been doing a microarray analysis um, of these tumor initiating cells, and that's a very important resource. Um, and this, the, the question is still open as to whether these represent true cancer stem cells, but they're definitely a very immediate source of cells that we can study. Now, what David Kaplan did, um, David is at the Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, um, was that he isolated these tumor initiating cells from a bone marrow aspirate, and he did a high throughput drug screen. He took an NIH drug library and um, tested them for it, the drugs for their ability to kill these tumor initiating cells. And um, what David discovered was um, that a particularly potent hit was this compound called MG624. And here, um, what he's measuring is the percent um, sphere number compared to no treatment. And um, he's testing this drug on the neuroblastoma cells, and his control are these um, skin precursor cells, which represent normal neural crest stem cells that are set aside in hair follicles. So you can actually take skin biopsies and grow up these crest stem cells. Um, and they behave more like normal cells. And as you can see here, the yellow bars, as you increase the dosage of MG624, you see a drop off um, in the number of neuroblastoma uh, sphere forming cells. Whereas the control cell line, which are the skips here, if anything, MG624 seems to promote proliferation of these. So there's a highly selective effect of this drug on the neuroblastoma cells as opposed to these uh, skin-derived neural precursors. When I asked David what kind of drug this was, he said, well, it was licensed for use in Italy, and it turns out that it's a nicotinic receptor antagonist. And I said, what? Because my lab has been doing two different things. We've been very interested in neuroblastoma and how it forms. And the other part of my lab has been very interested in the role of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in guiding the development of the nervous system. And here was an example where my two, what I thought were separate parts of my lab, suddenly came together um, conceptually. And so, um, I got very excited by this observation. I said, how could this be possible? What is going on? And um, before we decided to do a lot of experiments with MG624, we said, well, wait a minute. Right, it's a drug. It could be acting anywhere. It was originally characterized as a nicotinic antagonist. Maybe we'd better find out if these tumor-initiating cells are truly express <coughs> nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And that would be no surprise, because remember, neuroblastoma is a uh, transformation of a sympathoadrenal precursor cell, and both chromaffin cells and sympathetic neurons are known to express nicotinic receptors. That's what their normal function is. And um, this is the structure of MG624, um, and um, it looks uh, sort of like acetylcholine. That's the normal ligand for the nicotinic receptor. And um, nicotine was identified, you probably know it as the active component of cigarette smoke. Um, that causes people to become dependent on smoking. Nicotine looks like acetylcholine and is able to selectively activate these receptors. And MG624 was identified as a drug that would act like nicotine, but actually inhibit the effect of nicotine. Um, and I need to tell you a little tiny bit more about nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, so please bear with me. Um, they are most um, well understood in the nervous system. They mediate fast transmission. You probably are most familiar with nicotinic receptors in terms of your muscle twitches, right? So nicotinic receptors on your muscle are the ones that allow you to contract your muscle so that you can move around. Um, they're also abundantly expressed in the brain. And as well, it's becoming recognized that even non-neural cells express express nicotinic uh, receptors. And um, there is a small but burgeoning field starting to examine the expression of nicotinic receptors in such cell types as lung epithelia. And um, as well, um, it's been discovered to be abundantly expressed in small cell carcinoma. The nicotinic receptor uh, proteins, the functional receptors themselves, are pentamers. 
So that means five polypeptide chains come together to make a functional receptor. Um, and um, the names of these different polypeptide chains are alpha 1 through 10, beta 1 through 4, gamma, delta, and epsilon. Um, the neuronal nicotinic receptors, such as the ones found on sympathetic neurons, are composed of either alpha 2 through 10 or beta 2 through 4. So now if you imagine you have five of these coming together to form a functional receptor, and you have to have at least two alphas and, um, and a variable number of betas, you can see that there are many, many different combinations of nicotinic receptors that can be formed. And here for you is a picture of a single polypeptide chain. So for example, this would be a single alpha subunit, goes through the membrane four times. Um, and here's a picture of the pentamer. Here in this case, uh, it turns out alpha-7 can form, you can bring five alpha-7s together to make a functional receptor. Um, and um, many other receptors are formed by different combinations of alpha-4 and beta-2. Okay, so here's where we wanted to know whether these genes were in fact expressed in those tumor-initiating cells that David had been characterizing for their sensitivity to these various drugs. And we didn't know what receptors would be there, so we developed primers for quantitative real-time PCR to, to measure different uh, subunits. And the purple bars are the different um, neuroblastoma stem cell lines that are derived from the bone marrow aspirates. And the blue ones are um, the skin precursor cells, the normal cells that this drug did not affect. And yellow is a normal sympathetic ganglia, and we felt that we really needed to have that normal there for comparison um, because um, we wanted to know whether the levels were comparable to a normal ganglion or much elevated. And you can probably see right off the bat right here that if you look at this gene, CHRNA5, that the neuroblastoma cells are out of this world. They are hugely, many of them are showing five to 40-fold higher levels of this gene in comparison to the normal sympathetic ganglion, which is set at one. So this is fold uh, relative RNA expression. And you can see also that um, two other subunits are highly expressed in these cells, CHRNB2 and CHRNA7, although the levels of expression of these two genes, they're detectable but they're, if anything, lower or comparable to a normal sympathetic ganglion. But we, our eye was really captured by this huge level of the CHRNA5. This is the gene that encodes the alpha-5 subunit of the nicotinic receptor. And of course, right away, I turned to Javed Khan's um, microarray database because it's available online. Um, this is where he has taken microarray data from various neuroblastoma tumors and compared a uh, level of different gene expression compared to survival. And here you can see that elevated levels of CHRNA5 um, correspond or correlate with very poor prognosis, very poor survival rate. 